In the book of Ephesians, Paul wrote a letter to explain who we are and what we have in Christ. At the time in history that Paul wrote this letter, Christians were on the run. They had no rights. They were in great danger. Paul actually wrote this letter while on house arrest in Rome. And despite his circumstances, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, describing the fullness and richness of life in Christ. The letter to the Ephesians explained what it meant to be in Christ, to be the church, the body of Christ. Paul knew that if the Ephesians understood who they were and began to live in Christ, the world would never be the same. The same can be true for our church today. If we understand what it means to live in Christ, to be the church, our city and our world would never be the same. Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. If you are tuning in from somewhere else, welcome to somewhere else. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a flat tire? Oh, the flat tire experience. It's one that is hard to forget. You remember them all throughout your life. It's a special thing, isn't it? Getting a flat tire. I remember my last flat tire experience. We were on the way back from Disney World. Where else would we be going? <laughs> About half-ish the way home. The tire pressure indicator, yes, modern cars sometimes have these. We're fortunate enough to have one of those in that car. You'll find out why I got rid of it in a moment or two. It went off, letting us know you're rapidly losing tire pressure. Okay. So we found an exit, a gas station, the air pressure machines. I love them. They still have the old gauges on it. it tells you how much you got. I filled it up. You try that first. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. The weather changed. It's a little low because of that. So you check it out. But no, the tire pressure indicator was letting me know you are still rapidly losing pressure. So I got to change the tire. And it ain't like the Christmas story, right? Like, time me. Let's go, Ralphie. It's not fun at all. I don't like doing those things. So who does? I don't know. But Ralphie's dad. Anyway, <laughs> I get out. And I'm like, OK, we're going to change the tire now. So I look in the trunk. It's a fairly new car, and I remove the mess that's in the trunk and look underneath the mess for the tire. But there's no tire there. Uh, so I look at all the other places where there might be a tire, right? There couldn't possibly be a tire there, like, you know, I, I don't know, under the hood, whatever. <laughs> underneath the car, some of us are old enough to remember cars like that. They're like underneath there, there's a little tire under there. Nope. So I'm going to admit, I'm going to try to be a manly man here. I'm going to admit, it took a couple phone calls and some Google searching to find out why my car didn't have a spare tire. Because that tire is something called a run flat. A run flat tire. I'd never had a run flat tire before, and I won't ever again. <laughs> because you can only go 50 miles per hour safely. I'm a safe person. My wife will tell you I'm a very safe. I've been in a lot of really bad car wrecks, so I play it safe. I don't go over the speed limit very often. 50 miles an hour, and you can only go 50 miles. That's it. And we're a lot more than that away from home. We're like halfway. <sighs> OK. What do you do now? Well, we found a hotel room. And since we didn't have a spare tire, we found ourselves with some spare time. The next day, I think-ish, we found a tire place. And of course, 
we needed to replace like three tires, right? That's always what happens. Whenever they check out the one tire, well, you gotta replace all of them, right? Maybe they gotta be balanced, I don't know. So, vacation got extended and expensive, <laughs> but we got home. Sometimes a breakdown will leave you with a spare tire. Sometimes it'll leave you with some spare time, definitely not spare change. We're in a new series, as you saw from the video, on the book of Ephesians. It's going to be fun, six weeks. This is going to be the first one, a chapter each week-ish. I talked to you about staying in a series in the past. This is fancy speak, it's expository teaching. I'm pulling from the text. It's really good to stay in the text if you want to get the context. It's really important. I don't like to do it the other way around, right? So we're going to do a sermon series on my dog. You'd love that one, all right? <laughs> like six weeks about my dog. And I'm just picking scriptures about dogs and things like that. So some people do this kind of thing, and they get things out of context when they do that. I stay in the text, and I do large portions of the text. Sometimes there's a follow-up in the Bible study on Wednesday to cover more stuff that I don't have time for here. Observation, interpretation, and then application. How does this apply? What does this mean to me today? I've told you in the past that the tradition in the early church was reading these letters or books of the Bible aloud. They would just read them. We're going to move into a series on the book of Hebrews. It's not about coffee. And we're going to look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New. You can almost view the New Testament, some of these letters, as a commentary on the Old Testament. Hebrews reads like that. He's adjusting, whoever the author is, a lot of things. But if you've read Hebrews, you'll recognize it's kind of like a letter-ish, but not really. It reads more like a sermon. A lot of people think that this is a scribe or someone copying down one of maybe Paul's sermons. It reads kind of more like that. And indeed, this would be done. We see this in the letter to the Colossians, where he says, read these things aloud in the church. So Heather told you, Romans 16, about Phoebe. Phoebe was the deliverer of the letter, perhaps. She read it aloud and explained some things to people when they needed explaining. Here in Ephesians, we have Tychicus. That's a fun name to say. Tychicus. <laughs> and he definitely delivers the letter, and Paul says he'll explain the other things to you. So these people did this, they'd read these letters aloud. I'll do a standalone, as we saw last week, when there are some things to explain, a topical sermon, but for the most part, we're in a series. Now, you usually cover all these things along the way. Some people will approach me and say, hey, why don't you do a series on this or that? Well, here's the thing, when we're in Ephesians, covers everything from our relationship with Jesus to our relationship with our spouse, our children, people we work for. So these things are covered along the way. I want to tell you a little bit about Ephesians. It's a letter from Paul to the church in Ephesus with some similarities to Romans. Remember I told you, when in Rome during that series, Paul in Romans is writing to a church that he has not been to yet. Ephesians well, he's been to that place, but he's writing to some people who he has not met yet. The church develops there. We're going to talk about his travel plans, his missionary journeys. We learned that Paul got to Rome eventually. How? Well, not quite as he expected, I'm sure. He kind of got a flat tire on the way, so to speak, in the form of a shipwreck. But when he got there... We read in Acts, we're going to look at Acts a lot, Acts 28, starting at verse 30. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house in Rome and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So he's on what I would call like a house arrest there. He has plenty of time on his hands. He probably wrote Ephesians from Rome in that spare time. Spare time. When we break down or the worst happens, we think we've been diverted or slowed down in some way from the mission. But in reality, what we're reading today might not have been written if Paul hadn't 
broken down or gotten stuck, so to speak. He also wrote other letters from there, so this is probably one of them. Ephesians is in some ways a summary of what we read in Romans. It is also a summary of what we here at C3 are trying to do well. Theology and that application, being the hands and feet of Jesus. I told you last week, both word and deed. So, I want to give you a little bit of background on Ephesus. Ephesus. I'm going to be a little bit more teachy than preachy for a couple minutes, but I think you guys will survive. It won't feel just like school or anything. (laughs) According to Strabo, it was second in importance and size only to Rome. So I want to show you some pictures. Here we go. So there's the library of Celsus here. I didn't know what that was before I looked it up. So anyway, that's kind of cool. You have terrace houses. You can picture this in your mind when they're talking about homes. Maybe this is what it looked like. They have a theater like Rome. It's also home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple of Artemis or Diana. This is Apollo's uh, twin sister in Greek mythology. Doesn't look like much, does it? (laughs) It's all ruins. Ephesus is not like Rome in the sense where they kept building modern buildings around the old structures. It's just a ruins. But archaeologists get a lot of stuff still to this day from there. The temple probably looked like this. There you go. Really huge. So you got to picture a big uh, statue of Artemis, maybe in the back of it, and people are going there to worship her. These are regional letters. This is where it gets really interesting. We'll probably talk about this at Bible study for all of you who want to nerd out with me. But if you study this, it begins to make these letters make more sense and makes your Bible a little bit smaller and easier to understand. This is a regional letter. People get hung up on like the prison letters and this and that and the other thing. Regional letter. It bears great similarities and connections to 1st and 2nd Timothy, Colossians, and Philemon. Some of the same people are mentioned, but not in Ephesians, and I'll tell you why. The similarities to Colossians and Ephesians are great. 75 out of the 155 verses run in parallel form. They're almost identical. There are whole parts of it which are just totally and completely identical. You should read them together. This may be, and this is real interesting if you've been in church for a long time, a lot of people don't know this. This may be that missing letter to the Laodiceans. It's a fun thing to say to you. Laodicea, Laodiceans. It's mentioned in the letter to Colossians. All right, so read that letter that I sent to Laodicea too, but we don't have it. It's not in our Bible. What is it? Many scholars think that Ephesians is it for a couple of different reasons. One, where Ephesus is named in our Bibles, if you look at a good modern Bible, it'll bracket the word Ephesus in the beginning because early manuscripts didn't have the word in there. It was just a blank. And so Tychicus perhaps could take it to Laodicea and fill it in. Laodicea. Interesting. Also, it doesn't have the identical lists of names of people that the other regional letters have. It's not there. It's void of a lot of personal greetings that you would normally have in these letters. So it makes sense, right? If you want to send it to two different places, you make it a little bit more generic. So just a point of interest there, not incredibly important for a Sunday morning. Ephesians. It's been called the queen of the epistles by some. It's a lot of high theology, really fancy speak and fancy sounding things, but we like to quote a lot of popular lines. Don't Let the sun go down on your anger. Ephesians 4, 26, we see the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 4, starting at verse 11 in the church. The armor of God, we love that one. That's chapter 6. And probably the most theologically significant line in the letter is Ephesians 2, 8. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Let me stop right there. But why? Keep reading. Ephesians 2.10, we get a possible thesis statement for the whole letter. If you're very familiar with it, you may agree. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time. That's all over the first chapter. So that we should walk in them. That is the point. Ironically, previous two verses 
are used to excuse away <laughs> to 10. I don't have to do anything, right? Extreme grace theology, but it misses the context of the whole letter. It's all about getting from theory to practice. Ephesians is about unity, usefulness, and you. Who Christ is, what he did, and how everyone should be responding to that. Unity. Similarities to Romans, remember? That was the real reason for writing the letter, as we learn. Yeah, there's some great theology in there along the way, but Paul didn't set out to say, ooh, let me write a great theological work that people are going to look at years from now and memorize and stuff. No, it was for the church in Rome. Remember the problem of unity between the Jews and the Gentiles. This is a problem all over the place, but it's compounded by the fact that the Jews were kicked out of Rome by the Emperor Claudius. We learned that in the last series. Well, the Gentile believers, the so Jewish Christians, the Gentile believers still build up the church. The Jews come back after Claudius dies, and they come back to a church that's not so very Jewish, and so there's disunity. They're having this conflict in Ephesus as well for different reasons, and this is addressed. Ephesians 2.14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us, and he united Jews and Gentiles into one people when, in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Paul is a Jewish Christian. He did this by ending the system of law with its commands and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, unity, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Now, if you know me, you know I often attempt this at Bible study, <clears throat> speed reading <laughs> through an entire letter for the Bible study. <laughs> Try to get it in a half hour and see if I can do it. But there's a purpose to this. It's because when you read large sections of Scripture, the whole letter, as it would be in the church back in the day, you get the big picture. It's an excellent exercise. And so in reading Ephesians, you'll notice something. Ephesians starts with Christ-central theology. Christ is at the center of the whole thing. And then works its way out into broader circles, kind of like concentric circles centered in Christ. Or you could think of it the other way sometimes. So here's what you have. Center point in Christ. Then who Christ is, right? The gospel, your role in it. And then we start to get people groups. Jews and Gentiles, as we saw in chapter 2. Now, one body, the body of Christ, the church. Now, who those parts of the body are, your role in it. Family groups, how we should behave, widens out. How we behave in the workplace, then it would be like bond servants or slaves, but it applies to us in that way, how we treat people who are in charge of us. And how we equip ourselves for this work, the armor of God. So it kind of radiates out when you look at the big picture. So try it sometime. Get an easy to read version. If you have trouble with it, just read the whole thing. Six chapters will take you 20, 30 minutes. And if you read quickly, if not, an hour. It's a good investment of your time, I think. Ephesus, we see it in Acts. I've talked about the practice. It's a really cool thing to do of when you read one of Paul's letters, try to find that place in Acts and then read that chapter. So if you're reading Philippians, read Acts chapter 16. If you're reading 1st or 2nd Thessalonians, Thessaloniki or Nica, tomato, tomato, it doesn't really matter, read chapter 17 of Acts. Corinth, Corinthians, 1st or 2nd. Read chapter 18 of Acts. So today, we're going to focus a little bit on chapters 18 through 21-ish of Acts, because we see Ephesus pop up. But it's a large portion of Scripture, so I'm going to kind of paraphrase my way through it for you. It's kind of interesting, because here's where we see three of our series intersect in the book of Acts. It's kind of cool. So if we went back to 16, we'd see four of our past series intersect, which is kind of cool. So we'll definitely get Rome, we'll get Corinthians, and we'll get Ephesians or Ephesus in here. So remember, 
Heather, a couple weeks ago, talked about Priscilla and Aquila. It's not Aquila, it's Aquila in Greek. Interesting. But that's not important. What was important was their role. They were really good friends with Paul, and they taught Apollos, as we will see in Acts. Really interesting, but they intersect. They are leaving Rome because of this edict by the Emperor Claudius. And that's why they meet Paul in Corinth. So we see that in chapter 18. They hang out together. They're all Jewish Christians. They're leather workers or tent makers. So they spend about a year and a half-ish or so in Corinth. And then they head out to Ephesus. Paul doesn't stay long, but he says, I'll come back, Lord willing. Priscilla and Aquila stay there. They run into a guy named Apollos. If you were with us in our Corinthian series, you remember Apollos was at the center of this disunity in the church at Corinth for a different reason. They're doing what I would call pastor worship. Right? So they're making Apollos really important, or Peter really important, and Paul not so much. So there's a bit of a problem there. So it's the first one that Paul addresses in Corinth. It's interesting. I think Heather noted it a couple weeks ago that Priscilla is often mentioned before Aquila, which is a little different. And she may have also mentioned that they taught Apollos. It's kind of interesting. But he goes on to be like a really, really, really good teacher. <clears throat> the map that I didn't notice pop up on the screen behind me. So here we're looking at Paul's third missionary journey. So that's what I'm talking about now in these chapters here. And if you didn't find it yet, Ephesus is across from Athens. So if you just go to the right there, east, and you have to make a whistling sound when you do it, you'll get to Ephesus. You see Laodicea and Colossae right there. You see the regional letters. This is really cool. Uh, in your Bibles, they will often have something like this, a couple of different maps. And it is really nice to get a visual of where these places are. So Paul... He comes back to Ephesus, and some pretty crazy things happen. I'll shorten it for you, make it kind of quick. Paul is doing great miracles. God is using Paul, and there's crazy things happen. Like, if you touch Paul's clothes, you get healed. It's just nuts. And so lots of people are coming to Christ. And in that process, they're offloading all their pagan stuff. And so one of the things that happens is they start burning all their, like, magic books. Just think of it like if Muslims in mass converted to Christianity, they would be burning their, their Korans, that kind of thing. So that's happening. Some versions say it's millions of dollars worth of this stuff, 55,000 pieces of silver is exactly what it says. So this is starting to have an effect on the economy. It's kind of bad. Michael Overway, last week when he spoke, I think he said that there are a lot of silver workers or metal workers there in Ephesus. So I want you to think of it this way. It's kind of like Disney World, but religious. <laughs> a lot of people come from all over to go there. Seven wonder of the world. You have this temple of Artemis. They're going there to worship. So it's a tourist destination. And there's these silversmiths that make idols. Idols are something that you, you worship. You worship these things made out of silver or some kind of metal, and they sell them. And this guy named Demetrius says, this guy Paul's got to go because he's affecting our economy. We're going to lose business. So they start a riot in the temple. A big riot goes on. It's hard to control. It gets quite out of control. They're worshiping Artemis for like two hours. <laughs> Great, it's Artemis of the Ephesians, they keep saying over and over again. Creates a bit of a, pro a problem so that Paul has to get out of town. So he escapes to Greece. Uh, he'll document a lot of his travels. He'll stop through Philippi. Eventually, he ends up in Troas, where, interestingly, he preaches a guy named Eutychus to sleep. <laughs> Eutychus falls out a window and dies. Don't worry, though. Paul heals him. So if I get, that's why I tell jokes, because if I get too boring, one of you could just die in the middle of my sermon. <laughs> Paul goes to Miletus. I had to throw that one in there. There's got to be a joke. You guys are getting bored. And there he addresses his Ephesian elders. I've told you about the speech that he gave while he was there. I paraphrase some of it for you. Remember, the blood is not on my hands. I've done my job. I preached the gospel everywhere I went. I didn't take money from anybody. So he's kind of like wrapping it up. Why does he do it from Miletus and not Ephesus? Probably the riot. 
He doesn't want to go back there. So he calls for them and they go to Miletus, not too far away. He's going to Jerusalem. He tells them, I'm going to go. So it starts to get interesting because one of the places he stops is entire. Remember what I said last week? He didn't always do what man told him to do. If he knew or Jesus gave him instructions, I told you he traveled by the Holy Spirit. We see this, Acts 13, Acts 16. He's just obedient to wherever God tells him to go, not man. He's warned entire, don't go to Jerusalem. <laughs> he goes anyway. Uh -huh. Jesus told me I got to go there. He makes it to Caesarea and he stays with Philip. If you know a lot about Acts, you know that Philip is one of the first deacons in the early church, chapter 6, chapter 8. He, uh, he preaches to the, or reads Isaiah, to the Ethiopian eunuch, converts and baptizes him. He's at Phil Philip's house. Philip has four virgin daughters who are prophets, prophetesses. <laughs> How do you, is it a prophet or a prophetess? I don't know. I'll leave that up to you. Anyway, a guy named Agabus shows up. And prophets do some cool stuff. If you read the Old Testament a lot, they often act out what's going to happen to the person. And that's what he does. He takes Paul's belt. Whoever owns this belt is going to be bound. Jews are going to hand him over to the Gentiles. So they're like, Paul, don't go. They're begging him, don't. Don't do it. Again, he's told. He concludes himself. Don't go there. Paul says, what are you doing to me? If I have to die for Jesus, I'm going to die for Jesus. They say they couldn't convince him, so the Lord's will be done. He goes. Indeed, the Jews make an accusation against him when he gets there. It's that he led a Gentile into the temple. Guess you're not supposed to do that. There are portions of the temple you're not supposed to go in. It wasn't true. They try to kill him, and he gets handed over to the Romans. But not exactly the way Agabus said. The Romans actually save him from getting stoned to death or killed. They save him from a murder plot, too. And they take him to different places, but he's arrested. He's in prison the whole time. I told you how Festus was corrupt, and he kept him in jail for two years expecting a bribe. Did Paul complain? No, he didn't. He went on to that hearing I've told you guys about, right? King Agrippa and Bernice or Berenice. They didn't know what to do with him, <laughs> so they wouldn't let him go. But guess what? Paul appealed to Caesar. So now he's got to go to Rome. Tells us in a speech a little later that Jesus had told him that. You're going to go all the way to Rome, Paul. So he knew it and went with confidence. We saw what happened. I told you he got shipwrecked, a little flat tire experience. But he did the exact opposite of what they told him to do. And he got to his destination in Christ, prepared ahead of time for him. Paul receives his instruction from God not man. And here's your application. Through prayer, speaking with God, but more importantly, listening. Two ears, one mouth for a good reason. So we see Paul's prayers throughout in the first chapter of Ephesians. Here's one of them. Ephesians 1.18, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, you, who are his rich and glorious inheritance, some versions say, the eyes of your heart be enlightened, so that you may know the hope. As great of a theological work as this is, we must seek to know God in our hearts, not just our minds. We need to get from, and this is how we get from theory to practice, it's both. The eyes of our heart means that we grow, not just in knowledge of him, which is very important, but also in our love for him. This naturally overflows to others. This is relationship, and we achieve this through prayer. When we experience breakdowns in life, what's our go-to? When we're forced to stop. The song's still. That wasn't even planned. That always happens. God incidences with the worship team. We get in sync. Are we still? What do we do? Do we pray? Do we listen? Do we seek God? We've either got a spare tire or some spare time sometimes. I've learned that if you don't 
maintain the things which make contact with your path, you'll need to use your spare tire. And if you don't have one, you'll definitely have some spare time. And our first inclination is to say, yeah, you need a spare. How many of you thought, well, did you get a spare tire after that, Gene? <laughs> did you buy a fourth one and put it in the trunk? But we must remember that the spare tire isn't the ideal thing. It's not. Have you ever put it on? <laughs> when I was a teenager, I did. You ever put the spare tire on and think, well, that's the tire. I'm going to drive around on that from now on. Well, I was really poor and a kid. That's what I did. <laughs> My cars looked kind of funny. But as we grow up, as we mature, we don't do that. It's a temporary fix, just like the patch. We don't patch a tire thinking that that's the permanent solution for this problem. No. So in this way, these things are just temporary fixes. Maybe it's a patch over a hole in our relationship with God. We need to be about the business of maintaining those things that make contact with our path. We don't see these other things as a permanent solution. But sometimes God is good enough to remove the spare tire in order to create some spare time for us to be with him, to take away the patch that we've been using to cover up the holes in our relationship with him. And sometimes we'll do anything to get to that destination that we think is the right place to go. But God helps us realize the gift is in his journey and his destination, his way, his plan. Again, for we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk or drive in them. And sometimes... Even if we think we're doing a really good job maintaining these things, we hit a nail in the road. We always think it's a bad thing, but nails often have an important purpose. In our lives, nails often have their purpose. Sometimes that purpose is prayer. It's funny how often it takes tough times to bring us to our knees. We don't often voluntarily do that, do we? It has a purpose to get us to stop and slow down. So perspective. Paul had really good perspective. And good perspective, time with God, gives us a good attitude about things. We start to see them rightly. As I said in the past, when we make the gospel primary, we see everything else differently. So, the question is, what are we doing with our spare time? This whole thing has given some of us some spare time. How are we using it? Are we using it to get closer to God? Time in prayer? In the Word, maybe? Maybe read Ephesians? I don't know. Sometimes that flat tire leads to spare time. So, what are we doing with it? Often when it seems like when we're being diverted from the mission, it is really God just slowing us down, giving us an opportunity to reflect, slow down, see something maybe we haven't seen before as we are rushing along to get to what we think is the destination. But is it? The only way to know is through prayer. So there are prayers throughout Paul's letter to the Ephesians. kind of interesting if you listen to it, which I would recommend. It's kind of cool. If you're not familiar with it, it'll almost sound like the letter's ending a few times. We even say amen. But then he keeps going. Think about that for a minute. These letters are like prayers interlaced throughout the whole thing. That's how prayerful Paul is. He's in commune with God as he's writing this thing. Our prayers are often the same today. So this is my prayer for you as well. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to end this morning. Well, we're going to sing another song, but I want to pray some verses over you. We're going to honor a tradition of the early church in just reading these letters aloud. And you're going to see it pertains to us as well. So let me pray for you this morning through God's holy scripture. Ephesians 1, 5. Ever since I heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that 
You might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of his church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters, and may God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.